just um, tell you all um, how excited I am personally, um, uh, because it's really like a dream come true for me. Um, when I had this idea, maybe about four or five years ago, um, and approached uh, Lee, uh, President Lee Bollinger, and and, and then um, with together with Merritt, uh, and thank them so much. Um, my heartfelt gratitude to both uh, uh, President Bollinger and also um, uh, Merit, uh, uh, Dean Merit Jana for accepting and looking favorable to the program. And then of course, to Jean-Marie Bueno, uh, who has put together this uh, program as the director and to welcome um, all the participants, all the um, uh, wonderful diplomats from uh, so many countries. And of course, the very rich uh, panel uh, um, uh, today and also uh, other um, panelists um, and leaders and speakers uh, during the rest of the week. Um, and all throughout my career, um, um, living across and working across four continents uh, in, in, over 40 years, I've always believed that um, you needed to bring together uh, what I call term the golden triangle, government, business, and civil society leaders together to solve uh, the big, uh, large global societal problems of the world um, that lead to conflict. And um, as uh, so rightly um, uh, Dean and Jano put together, uh, said, conflict is on the rise, unfortunately, in the world. Conflicts are on the rise and all kinds of conflicts, uh, not just political conflicts, but uh, economic conflicts, financial conflicts, uh, urban conflicts, they're all, all uh, conflicts are on the rise. And so um, whatever small dent we can put into the rise of conflicts through a program like this, bringing together diplomats, creating a relationship between them and also letting, uh, um, then learn uh, practically from leadership in uh, uh, from business government and the civil society that is, that is present in these panels on um, their experience on how they have resolved conflict. I think it will go a long way uh, to um, making a difference and um, any small difference that we can make, um, I know um, uh, will will we'll, we'll make the world better for the next generations to come. So once again, thank you all uh, for participating, for being here and for your uh, leadership um, that I know will make a big difference this week. Um, thank you. We are certainly seeing increased competition between China and the United States and a new ideological struggle between the principles of authoritarian state capitalism and democratic free market capitalism. But this is not now and need not become a new Cold War. At the present time, China and the United States do not represent an existential threat to each other. Continuation of their extensive economic ties and a benign geopolitical environment are essential if both countries are to achieve the economic growth and prosperity that each has promised to its people. And both countries understand that their cooperation is essential for confronting the global challenges of pandemics, climate change, and the disruptive effects of revolutionary, revolutionary technological change, all that threaten the world community. But neither is this a new bipolar moment for the international system. The past two decades have seen not only the emergence of China, but the consolidation of Europe as an economic powerhouse, a renewed global role being claimed by Russia, the rise of India as a major power, the emergence of influential middle power states like Japan, South Korea, Brazil, Turkey, Israel, Indonesia, Iran, South Africa, and the increasing importance of the regions of Southeast Asia, Africa, and South Africa. This is not quite the multipolar world wished for by some, given the dominant global roles that will continue to be played by the United States, Europe, Russia, India, and China in particular. But many nations are in a position to insist that their interests and perspectives be taken into account 
and to make use of the various international and regional organizations that have emerged in the last several decades to do so. In parallel with developments at the state level, as Jean-Marie pointed out, we are seeing the diffusion of power away from the nation states towards non-state actors that have an increasing role in the international system. For good, in the case of civil society, the private sector, philanthropic groups and universities, or for ill, in the case of terrorist groups, traffickers, cyber criminals, and nationalist extremists. These new actors have leveraged their influence through the explosion of the internet, the emergence of the new media, proliferation of new channels of communication, and new technologies like cyber and artificial intelligence. All these developments make for a much more complicated world than we've seen in the past. One of the several unintended consequences of globalization was that it threatened people's identities and their sense of social comfort. The social churn that industrialization, that urbanization brought uh, created fertile ground for the rise of new authoritarian leadership in both advanced industrialized countries and in developing countries, whether it's China, it's India, the US, multiple points in between. And they rely on nationalism for their legitimacy. They've built personality cults while making expansive promises, which they haven't kept yet. Uh, and it's much more difficult for these leaders to do the bargaining, the negotiating, the compromising, the give and take that diplomacy requires for a peaceful resolution or management of disputes and conflict. And the result is that, as you said, events do drive these leaders into ever more difficult positions. Uh, I'm not sure that the so-called sophisticated calculations of professionals ever actually drove the decisions that politicians made in our country, uh, countries, I'd I wouldn't make. But I think the problem is that we're in a world between orders. I think Steve described it very well. Uh, we're not sure where we're headed with leaders who seem unable to articulate a vision of where we should go. Uh, it reminds me of Alice in Wonderland. You remember, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, which maybe is a good way of describing where we are. But more seriously, I think the best description of our situation in the Indo-Pacific, at least, is Jesus' phrase of a hot peace, not a cold war. If it's still a peace and not war, it's probably because the disparities in power are still relatively great, because nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction are spread through Asia, from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, from Israel to Korea, and because all governments have been diminished by the COVID pandemic and are internally stressed. So yes, it is a much harder life for diplomats today. And I'm glad that I retired when I did. Uh, we are indeed being driven by events and that increases uncertainty, it increases risk, and it worries me considerably. I'll stop there. US-China relations, I think China is very confident today, uh, what I call, uh, in what I call triumphalism. Uh, and the, the general notion in China is that China is rising, the United States is declining, or the East is rising and the West is declining. And uh, so that's why China should be more assertive and more vocal in expressing itself internationally. Uh, and I, uh, I also argue that since 1949, when uh, the People's Republic was established, uh, the essential uh, concern of China about international relations is the Western interference, especially US interference in China's domestic affairs, trying to sabotage or undermine the Communist Party leadership. It is a notion, consistent notion since 1949 of starting from the Korean War to the Vietnam War to the Tiananmen Storm in 1989 to uh, a lot of recent uh, things like Xinjiang, Hong Kong, uh, 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 and Taiwan. These are, th are thought to be China's internal affairs. Uh, so US interference in those of uh, 
affairs uh, indicate that the United States is a hostile force and we should guard against these Western political interference or influences, including ideological influences. So I think uh, starting from there, uh, I think this China is domin dominated by its concern about its domestic order. And the United States on this part is more concerned about international political and economic advocates. China's United States is not very much, uh, until recently, the United States was not very much uh, worried about uh, its own uh, uh, problem. Uh, so it, uh, in the past, China was uh, more acceptance, uh, has showed, showed more acceptance to the international order advocated by the United States. And the United States actually respected China's internal order. But in, in recent years, domestic politics of both countries have changed. So uh, now the, the, the underlying uh, rationale has been broken. Uh, that is, the United States is trying to challenge China's inter internal order. And in, in, in turn, China is trying to undermine the US international order. Biden came into power, we were all thinking about a domestic agenda. It was clear that what he wanted to focus on was very much um, COVID, the economy, racial uh, issues in the United States, but very quickly, the international um, system or foreign policy kind of landed on his desk, some uh, more willingly, some, you know, in, in, with some areas less so. If Iran, Israel, Palestine, China, Russia, of course, um, withdrawn from Afghanistan and all that. And we don't have a real clear Biden doctrine in the sense of understanding the priorities. I think this is still in progress. What we do get, and we got a sense so far, is something about Biden's diplomatic style, his approach to conflict resolution. Um, and this kind of gets back to something he said, I think it was two weeks ago, almost, uh, in the summit with, uh, with uh, uh, President Putin, where he said that foreign policy is an extension of personal relations. And the internet blew up over this. Uh, people were you know, thinking, you know, this is obviously not true. Yes, this is an exaggeration, but the fact that it is an exaggeration doesn't mean that we should ignore it because there is a core of truth in it, uh, not just across time and space that we've seen it, but also because he believes it's true. And he will, and that will have ramifications for how he, for how the United States conducts foreign policy. So, you know, we have personal diplomacy and the kind of personal relationship between leaders that seem to matter a lot before World War One. World War One kind of showed the collapse of that system of kind of this personal diplomacy before between leaders as shaping how leaders gauge each other's intentions, the interests, resolve, and so on, and so on. But with World War II, we saw a big comeback, even during the Cold War, right? I mean, we all remember what Chamberlain said to the cabinet when he came back from meeting with Hitler. He came back, and what did, how did he rationalize the Munich Agreement? Well, he said, I established trust. I was able uh, to read him and establish trust with him. And that's how he was selling this to the British cabinet. We all remember the uh, um, Ronald Reagan and the end of the Cold War, right? Well, the, you know, the intelligence community was writing about how the Soviets was preparing for World War III. Ronald Reagan came out and said, no, 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 this, this is a new type of leader. And how was he able to get that through this personal interactions? And we see this very, very clearly um, also with, uh, um, uh, with Biden so far. A lot of the time, if you, talk, if you see about how he talks about foreign policy, it is very personal, it's, it's a personalization of foreign, of foreign policy. It's the idea that let me, let me sit in the room and exercise this empathy that we've all come to know from domestic politics and externalize this to international relations. Let me sit and see what the other guy can and cannot do. What's their uh, bandwidth? 
And I think that this is important to keep in mind as we talk about the geopolitical context and the larger constraint from the international system, because at the end of the day, that foreign policy will be conducted by leaders. They are restrained, they are constrained, but it is important uh, to- Doubt whether the previous, uh, the former US president trusted his vice president. Uh, <laughs> so actually, he did, they didn't trust each other that much. Uh, so if they could not trust each other, how can China and the United States build up trust between the two governments or the two leaders? So I certainly don't think too much about trust. Uh, although previously I wrote about the mistrust united between the United States and China. So I think probably the, the more uh, essential question is that without trust, how can we understand each other's positions? Uh, to put your, yourself in, in, in the shoes of other people and then know what they are thinking about, not trust them. But so that is st still lacking between the United States and China and still lacking between China and India. Uh, for in instance, how, how, how much do we know India? So we don't, maybe we don't trust India, but how much do we know these, you know, uh, diversity of the Indian uh, uh, culture and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the population. If we don't know very much about India, that is out of the question. I mean, mutual trust cannot be uh, built up on that. Another point I want to make is that in democracy, in democratic societies, you don't trust each other, but I think you can engage each other in open debates. The problem with authoritarian states is that we don't necessarily trust each other, but don't, we don't quarrel with each other. Uh, for instance, in between the United States, between China and, uh, and the Soviet Union in the 1950s, we talk about sol solidarity, we talk about unity without any problem. But certainly all of a sudden, in 10 years of the, you know, after the People's Republic of China was accepted, China and, and the, the Soviet Union quarreled openly and finally they fought a war. So I think the historical lesson is that when we have a problem, we open, openly discuss the problem and then we try to, try to solve the problem rather than hide the problem behind the scenes. That's my point. Thank you. Shankar, do you want to say a word? Yes. Yes, please. I, I just want to echo what Jesus said about the, the importance of knowledge and understanding each other, because trust is a very hard thing to get to in most of these systems, both internally and democratic systems are competitive internally. So trust is not necessarily the first thing we build up, no matter how much we might argue and discuss and talk things through. Uh, but it's even more difficult when you have two very different systems at work, uh, like between India and China, for instance. But there have been periods when India and China have been successful in managing their differences, not in resolving them, but in managing them. And for me, that came from actually understanding each other's point of view and the conviction that the other person would follow their enlightened self-interest. Can I trust him to follow his rational self-interest? And is there enough overlap with my self-interest here for me to work on? I mean, it's a sort of Venn diagram, as it were, of overlapping interest rather than un fully understanding each other. Because, I mean, one of the things I am convinced of is that we in India don't understand China enough. We don't study China enough. Uh, and I think so. I'm just echoing what, what uh, Jisa just said about the need to actually study each of these difficult relationships and to understand where the partner is coming from. Uh, we don't do enough of that. I know we're, we're all committed to it verbally, intellectually, all diplomats will say our job is to build understanding and so on. But that's not what we spend our time doing, honestly. So I'll, I'm probably an outlier here, um, but let me answer the question this way. 
<clears throat> I don't think nations trust each other. I don't think that's the right way to talk about it. I think interest, nations have interests and the trick of international relations is to find out where there are common interests and be able to work together in those areas and manage the areas where interests clash so it doesn't result in conflict. But I don't think trust gets there. And I think these international institutions, again, many people view them as independent actors on the international scene. I look at them more as vehicles and forums where nations can work together to try to identify areas where they have common interests and work together and where they can try to manage those differences. I will say in deference to Karen, she's absolutely right though. It does make sense to talk about trust among leaders uh, and people, I think leaders make decisions in part by what they think the mindset is of the person on the other side of the table and whether that person on the other side of the table is reliable and able to deliver what they say. So I think trust between nations is a hard one, but trust between leaders is real. And in any event, for nations, it's interests, common interests, working together in, in areas of common interest, resolving differences where those interests class and international forums can be vehicles and international organizations can be vehicles and forums where that can take place. And they're very useful in that respect. Are much more uh, pacifist than male. When you get to the level of leaders, we don't see that anymore. What we see is actually female leaders are uh, becoming even more resolved, more aggressive in foreign policy, uh, or as aggressive as male. And the reason is, uh, according to kind of the finding in the literature, is that there is some sort of a performance that, that, that females feel that they have to compensate for a lack of credibility if they're, if they're not act as tough as they are as their male counterparts. So there is kind of almost compensation for that. Still, when you look at the, how they are perceived in terms of credibility, you see that even when they are more resolved and more uh, uh, aggressive, um, they're not being perceived as necessarily more credible or as credible as their male counterpart, counterparts. So there is really interesting differences. Uh, we see both at the level of, of, uh, of citizens and the level of leaders, and we are studying it further uh, more. Thank you very much for... <laughs> <laughs> for um, to our panelists for a very interesting conversation and thank you to the audience for very good questions. Um, we have our work cut out. I think there's a lot to be to be done. We could follow up on that conversation with the whole uh, seminar. Uh, we hope next time we meet in person.